As long as you give, you live. People were so selfish, everybody. It was, it, it was unbelievable if you come to think, everybody just for themselves. Everybody tried to survive. We were brought up to love people. We were brought up to care. Brought up, this was your life. I had the roots planted there. We got a word in Jewish, I tell them, <laughs> it's called chesed, it means with kindness, and that's how I was brought up. My roots were planted with my father already, but you never forgot because the roots plant comes up. I, I keep on analyzing it day and night when these people crowded in here, hundreds of people in the same moment all crowding in and all fighting. Sometimes you, you kept a piece of bread that you got under your head. When you came to your bread, somebody else took it. The morning it was gone, stolen by somebody else. Those most difficult times, we're still together. How can you love somebody like you love yourself? We you kept on helping other people. And there were many people who are helping each other. I was one of the few survivors still holding out under the water getter. If, if you kept a bit of food, some strong person used to pull it out, steal it, pull it out from you. People were standing, selling whatever they could to get a few, a few groschen to, to, to buy some, some food. Children in rags begging in the street, give me a stickle boy or a poor groschen, give me a piece of bread or a morsel of bread I haven't eaten for days. Do you remember the hunger? People were standing in the street. Musicians, famous musicians, were standing and playing and had a dish. People used to throw in money. There was always beggars in the street. Before the war that I'm even talking, always. My father never, never walked past anybody. Oh, the doctor was Shabbos. People always, my father brought always Ochem, uh, always Friday night and Shabbos. There were always people, and they were always sitting next to him, not at the end of the table. In September, the ghetto was surrounded. It was called the cauldron, this castle in Yiddish. My mother and my brothers and the infant and, and the, the, the children, the little, the, all the, they reported themselves. Where were they taken? To, to Umschlagplatz and to, 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 to Treblik. Did you see the Umschlagplatz? Umschlagplatz is a place of no return. I was tr trying to survive. They chased us into the street. My father and Roma, my niece Roma. The cattle trucks are packed to capacity with human cargo and return empty, ready for another load. I remember my father giving a piece of loaf sugar to an old man, I think he was a rebbe, who was walking down in front of him. Everybody was for themselves with young people. I was, 
we kept together. We thought otherwise. How did you survive? Then? Don't ask me. I survived. I'm here. I had Roma, who was like my child. And Roma was very, very thin ch child. She was a girl of 13, 14. And this was all I had. And I was like, a, have a children are calling me. I am like a second mother. They know that I saved. No, it doesn't mean it was a shame. The piece of bread that I got in Auschwitz, I used to just have a, a bite or two and let Roma, because she ate up quickly her little piece, she couldn't resist. And I gave it to her, so she refused at first. And then, how can you give me your piece of bread? But eventually she took it. I, I had to fight for her. So I, for her to remain alive, so I had to carry on to be strong next to her. The youngest looked after the older ones, and there was a, a couple of people who were forties, which was very old for us. It's alive, and I always felt sorry for her. And I tried to steal, and I don't know how I managed to be cold, so he told me to bend down, two SS was holding me and he was just beating me and beating me. The, the, the stick broke and then took another one. I think he took three, but by, after the second you don't have pain anymore. I couldn't walk, they carried me in and got me into hospital. I used to put under my clothes going out a piece of vegetable or something. To, for Roma and two Hungarian girls who were next to us, sleeping next to us, and they, they said they'll never forget us. I was Did you one, Yes, both of them in, in, in Bergen, Belsen after. And, and one day, when I was tucking in something under my underwear, I was told by a Russian, a non-Jew, who was also working with me in the kitchen, that the Oberstrom Führer saw me. He had an office in the corner like this, with glass, he was sitting, a big assessment, that he saw me. So he called me Helenka, because it's a Russian, for Hela, and he, he was pushing it at trolley with ash. He was, he had cleaned out the ash from under those big, uh, and he said, throw it in, and I did. And when the assessment called me in, I was searched and I had nothing. I would have been shot if they would have found something on me. You stop giving you stop living, you are just existing. This was Bergen-Belsen, just maybe two weeks before the end of the war. There was no bread, there was no water in the camp. We were all typhus, typhus, you know? We were all sick, everybody high fever, and then one girl cries out, I am dying, a little water, I can't, I can't anymore die. And that little girl sitting next to me, she had a little water. She was the only one who saved a little water. She took off the blanket and she took that little water and gave it to the girl. She didn't know if she wouldn't need that.
that little water. She was just in typhus, like we all were sick. This was in Bergen Belsen, before the liberation. But she gave away her little bit of water. Can you imagine what it was? It wasn't hundred dollars, thousand, million dollars. It was more worth than that. You know my number here? We see this number. So I remember I saw Dr. Mangala. He was taking out of the, the kids, the twins, and they were terrible screaming out. But so I saw him, he asked me how I was, I was, I was at 17, I looked strong, I was five foot ten. If you know what I mean, we come from a village, we look fat, you know, they not they look skinny. So he sent me to work. And uh, he said, you have to go and get yourself a number first. So I queued up for hours together. I didn't know even then what happened to my family. I had my number done. Auschwitz 8230. When the Nazis gave me that number, they didn't realize in Hebrew the alphabet as numbers as well. So an Aleph was a one, a B was a two. It's 8230. So it's 10 is 13. So that's, that's the Gematria is Ahava. Love on my arm. There's still a lot of hate in the world. I never learned actually. And I traveled with J Roots more or less the circumference of the world, telling him about love only. There's still a lot of hate in the world. I never learned actually. Love is the most powerful weapon in the world. Because it could stop any war without firing one bullet. It can annihilate my enemies without dropping a bomb. I can turn my enemies into friends. Love is the most powerful weapon in the world. Believe me, because <laughs> you got hope. We have to lerayahu kumoihu. We have to think about it. How can you love somebody like you love yourself? What does it mean? I have to love myself. I have to know who I am. I have to know what I possess. How much goodness, how much greatness, how much love, how much interest for people, how much desire to help people. I have to know what I am. Kumoihu. First you build up yourself. If you don't need a piece of chicken, if you have enough, a glass of water and a piece of bread, Kumoihu. Do you follow me? You have to be proud of yourself. You have to be great yourself. You have to know your possession. You have to know what you possess. And you have to be proud of what you possess. You have to be proud of yourself. A lot of people are against me when I say it. But never mind. I say it. I believe it. In order to give, you have to know what you possess. We should be able to give as long as you give, we live.